Hey guys, this is Velde from Moji here. Danish Counter-Strike is one hell of a drug, but so is Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and my guest for this one is going to be Jacob, a very well-known Norwegian player, primarily in the entry position. Mainly you'll know him from teams like Renegades, 100 Thieves, but he also had a past, believe it or not, he was actually in a team called G2 once. It's not the one you're thinking of, obviously, but I, just, I tease people like that at the beginning to make it think, make it sound sexier than it is. He wasn't playing with Kenny S, right? Don't worry about that. Right, to start out with Jacob, one thing I want to ask about you, because this just shows you how esports has changed now, because you know now in the modern day, we have like 16-year-olds, like Monty, getting like signed for 600k when they've never even played like a LAN game before, like in a real team or you have like Zewu just coming out of nowhere 17 everyone now I feel like the age and the idea of when you become pro is so different now because what's funny is when you first came on the scene I remember everyone being like he's just this really young talent but then when I looked it up it's like well you're like 20 already when you got in like the pro scene yeah 100% I mean uh, of course when when uh, early days you know CSGO came in the people that transitioned from 1.6 to CSGO wasn't as young as they are right now but it it feels the same for me. Like I remember the days as well where like you are a young kid, you're a young talent, I'm like twenty two, twenty one. And now you look at the people, it's like fourteen, fifteen, sixteen and they're just like on yes. big contracts in big teams playing tier one, like I don't know, it, it's a good change for you know, for CSGO and, and for the community and for the scene. But it's different days for sure. What was your background then from CSGO? Because like were you someone had you tried being like semi competitive in Source or one point six or something? I used to play a lot of 1.6, but never like anything serious. Uh, at the end of 1.6, before you know CSGO, CSGO came to Norway or like to the Norwegian scene, uh, everyone thought I was cheating. Uh, I was banned from like everything. Usually a good sign, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah probably good pretty sign. good. Every everyone that I always looked up to in Norway was like banning me from everything. <laughs> uh, but Is that the worst? Uh, the legends <laughs> get get the fuck out. But I actually got saved. You, I don't know if you remember for 1.6. Like in the end, Norway had like color. Which was the big the big star for us. Like growing up, of course, we had Reed and all these players that has always been, you know, sure. the ones I always looked up to. But towards the end, it was always Kalle. And Kalle said, like, you guys need to stop fucking banning people just because they have different playstyles. They're young, they're talented. So he actually got me unbanned. So when I entered CSGO, people have heard about me in Norway. So it was a little bit easier. Right. Actually, that's one thing I want to ask about, because one thing I always try in the context of different countries, if people don't know the background, there's like a different reason as to why countries go the way they do. So, you know, like in the Nordic region now, the funny thing is now Denmark's got this great rep as well. But like Denmark was always below Sweden in 1.6 if people don't know. And generally, actually, the real take was sort of like, why is Sweden like absurdly good with all the teams? But then why did the other ones have like one player, like a team? Aha. So I always used to have to explain like, well, first of all, Finland has that like military service you have to go and do and the Finland. The cap speaks bloody Swedish for me and the teams. Yeah, yeah. And then, but the Norwegian one's the one that made the least sense because, you know, when everyone also gets it confused, they're like, but can't Danes speak Swedish? It's like, listen, they might understand Swedish, but when they speak, fucking nobody would understand even if they were speaking Swedish. But I always say the weird one on the outside looks like Norway because obviously Norwegians and Swedes could be in teams easily. Like, even the differences are like quite slight. And if you were in a team long enough, you'd understand. But what I want to ask was this I've heard the difference that makes Norway unique, though, is that whole thing that, like, 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 I once went to Sweden for work early in esports, and then we went to an event in Norway. So I was like, Sweden's bloody expensive because I'm coming from the UK. And the joke is, when you went to Norway, it was like twice as much. And I was like, what? What's going on here? Like, I was getting like, like uh, the joke is, I was, it, I might be exaggerating here, but I swear, like, a Red Bull from like the gas station was like, like I think it was like eight euros or something, like 10 euros or something. And I was thinking, like, this can't be right. Like, is that for like the pack or something? You know, like four of them. And basically, what I found out was supposedly, like, because of the the country with the oil and all those sorts of things the, not only is the standard of living high but like costs are all high and as a result if, if people know how living costs work that means your average salary for your job has to be really high so i've heard basically in esports that's also why even great players like real if they were like actually i can make way more money off poker look i'm not gonna get to be like a champion at poker but hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna support my life whereas if i'm only making like you know 700 euros I'm kind of a loser to my friends if I tell them I make that. Like, I'm actually, I might look like an idiot, even though in esports I'm a star, you know. Is, was, is this is this accurate to this day? Is, is that still a thing for Norwegians, do you think? I'd say it's very accurate. Uh, like, if, you, if you're if you making 700 euros to, like, 2K in euros in Norway, that's legit close to nothing. Like, the expenses of, like, rents. Uh, and if you have, like, let's say if you have a car, you need to pay for gas, you need to pay for food. Like, you don't get anywhere with 2K, honestly. Uh that's why you see a lot of like people they uh, live together and they like share you know all the right 
all the expenses, right? Uh, couples, even friends living together. But I don't know, like, when I think back, Real was, for me, uh, as a Norwegian, I'm probably a little bit biased here. He was the best 1.6 player ever seen. Like He was extremely good. Uh, this he way, he's the guy behind the scenes where, yeah, because he didn't have all the championships, they're never going to see he was as good as Forrest publicly. Behind yeah. the scenes, by the way, the rep was like, he, he is like the Norwegian Forrest. Like, yeah, he's like, unbelievably good. Uh, right now, I know him. I know, like, I haven't met him in real life, but I, we have spoken many, many times, so I know him. And, of course, like, he made a living of poker, and he made way more living of poker than he would ever make of 1.6 because well, it wasn't now, big enough, right? Yes, but I think if he had the talent he had in the right time, like now in CSGO, he would definitely play CSGO, I feel like. Because has like, that affected you, though, that aspect? Like, has it made you ever had to consider, like, do I keep going with being a pro? Do I not? Because I notice that t- each time in your career, it feels like you yeah. leave a team, especially if you get kicked. You always sort of go back to Norway. You, like, regroup, and it feels <laughs> like you have to decide, do I keep doing it? Do I play for the Norwegian? You always have that choice, right? Yeah, yeah. And th- it's it's pretty funny, actually, because our first team was LGB, my first, like, professional team. And at the time I was working, uh, I don't know what it's called in English actually, but like before you get like a full time job, you're doing like a two year of like internship. Like, yeah, yeah. Something like that. And, and I was paid, I can't remember, but like after taxes, maybe like 2.5k euro. And that's pretty good, I would say. Uh, and then LGB came with an offer because we went with like a mixed team and we beat LC, which was like Rubino, Ray, and all these players. Right. And then they were like, shit, we need to bring Jacob in and we need to make a good Norwegian team. So then LGB came on, I wanted to make it, and the salary was 100 euros a month. And I was like, what the fuck? Do I need to like leave It's not even worth collecting the money for that, is it at all? And I was like, shit, but like my job, I have an all right job, but it's fucking boring to wake up seven in the morning. I, I want to try, you know? So I just went all in, 100, 100 uh, euros a month is nothing, of course. So I kind of live with, lived with my parents. But, uh, but yeah, like the... the like starting with CSGO made legit no sense. Because even crazy. the first couple of years, mate, like if I look, yeah, yeah. you're making fuck all prize money. Like you're getting like a thousand every few months or something, right? Yeah. So at this point, like essentially, did you actually have like the dream in your mind? Like I'm going to get to the top, like I'm going to be a top player? I, not at the start, I would say. Uh, my career has been a roller coaster, like for me the whole time. Uh, when, when we made LGB, I was like, fuck, I'm going to go all in. We're going to make it because I knew that I could be a good player. I have seen Rain. I knew that he could be, you know, a top, top player. And I thought we had the right people around us. And and then we made the major with LGB. We were three rounds away from, four rounds away, I think, from making uh, Legends at the third major. And then kind of it, it fell apart after, you know, like, of course, we were playing good. Rain was playing good. Teams wanted him. And then the team just fell apart. And then I think, like, at that point... I was questioning, is it worth it anymore, you know? When, when you lose your best player and you're replacing him with, you know, a much, much worse player, so we are not that good, people is not believing anymore, 100 euros a month, eh. I had to question it and, and ask if it was really worth it. And that is early to give up, you know? <laughs> but yeah, was, a lot of people... Was, yeah, go on. But that's that's was a reality for us. Like, that, like, like I said, like 100 euros in some countries might actually give you food on the table for, I don't know, two weeks. But fucking Harry Norway gives you a pizza and like a pizza delivery and a drink, you know, like it's it's different. Yeah, that's an aspect people never think about is when Rain made the Kingwin team with McAleary and it was like they made that national team, which obviously is the start of where a lot of people know Rain from. He had to leave all you guys behind to do so. so like, and, and the problem with that, I've seen this happen many times, mate. It's like, if you know he is really the best of you, you sort of, you feel like a dick if you say stay. You have to sort of be like, we have to go for it, you know. I just hope I get into a team later as well, you know, sort of, right? Yeah, yeah 100%. But I don't know, we were like... Rain was open with us. We always knew that, you know, if someone get the offer, you fucking go. You go all in. We all we all went all in. If someone get the offer, props to him. Good luck, you know. There is no there is no bad blood, no bad feelings because even though LGB kind of became dog shit after that, it's reality. Of course it is, and I think we all knew. Because the thing is, obviously, the place where you burst onto the scene was actually when you got to join, the Kingwin became G2, as I alluded to earlier. And when they initially became G2, they picked you up. This is because if people don't realise, they used to have Scream. Yeah, that guy with the fucking enormous name, all that. But the point is, he went back to the Titan team because he wanted to be in like a French-speaking team. And then you were one of the players that got brought in. Like, first of all, mate, if you come into a place to play like Scream, like, you've got pretty big shoes to fill there. But what people yeah. won't know is, dude, you were doing it in those first tournaments. You were fucking light 
beating everyone up. Like, they were the major... If people don't remember, I'll give people the stat here. Right, this is where that HLTV rating can never account for every role in the game. So on the HLTV rating, right, it goes like... Yeah, Dream Occlusion of Poker, you had a 1.09. That's just all right, isn't it? Until I point out, you had 0.8 as your kills per round. Like, yeah. if people don't know, that's like what fucking, like, Zewa would frag at right now if he's in a tournament. Like, or, like that basically means you were, you were lighting these first tournaments up, right? Yeah, 100%. And, and uh, there is a lot of context behind this. Because, like, me joining G2 seemed random. It seemed like Scream wanted to go to Titan and all this stuff. Like, there is so much more to it. I remember we actually beat those guys. We were playing as Copenhagen Wolves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple of, yeah. In in London, uh, DreamHack London, whatever it was called, I can't really remember. Yeah, it was DreamHack Open London. Yeah, yeah. And then Dennis messaged me, and Rain, of course, has vouched for me, you know? And he's like, are you good in CS? Because Rain wants to bring you. And I was like, I don't know, I think I'm all right. And they were like, because we have a player, I guess it was Scream, that they didn't want to play with anymore. Like, he was, uh, he was his play right. style, like, of course, like, he shoots headshots, etc., but he's not playing for the team, he's playing for himself. He was, he was baiting, etc., etc., I can just be that honest. Like that was the case, and yeah, they wanted sense. they wanted to replace him with me, and I think luckily for, I'm not sure if G2 wanted to replace him as an org because he has a massive brand, of course. Of course, yeah. And uh, but I think Titan wanted to bring him back, so it kind of like it just fit perfectly. So it looks like you know, Titan bought out Scream from G2 and yes. I replaced him, you know. But the, it wasn't really the case. I, th I think oh. they just like they were missing someone that was you know, that was playing for the team. Because they were had someone that there were so many individuals in that team, you know. Because one yeah. thing I want to ask about was this: because not just because the team, if everyone forgets, like they were obviously having these great runs in these tournaments. So like I say, because the stats like we're showing, like this is crazy about a fragging, by the way. Like this is like I say, this would be like superstar levels in terms of the output. Like one thing I feel like always screwed you over in this early period is people actually thought you have to do that every tournament. And you're gonna do that every tournament. Whereas one thing I always asked about was because if people might know in G2, especially famously after this, when Dennis went to Fnatic and it was kind of the team that you know for like a year and a half, it didn't really have a true IGL it was like it was a bunch of players who were all like good players on other teams sort of going like you take a turn now he'll take a turn like fuck maybe Rob Ann does it for a while you know what I mean like everyone's just shiv so it meant that the team didn't really have the proper structure so one thing I always wondered about in your case was I've heard stories from some of the others where some of them even say like oh you don't realise it's actually even more insane he was fragging like that sometimes we were like asking him to be like in a support position or something and he was fragging out like that so what was your role in this team like, wh like were you someone who you thought I am supposed to be a star am I supposed to frag out what was it like at that time yeah, I don't know. It's it's a tricky question. I've asked myself that question so many times as well. Like, what what was even my role? What was my like? You know, right now it's so more much more defined. You know, people like the, this. The game has developed so much that you know you have this like this type of thing. Like back in the day, teams were lucky if they had like fucking an open and an IGL. Like when we were when we were G two, like this was on the fly. There was no IGL. One round maybe Dennis had a call. Maybe Michael had a call. We just got a kill, some kills here or you know like it was random. It was just good friends having a good time and shooting hard and doing it together. It was basic as that, you know. And of course, that is not going to work long term. Like, I think, I think Kluge, it's like Loki a fluke, in my opinion. Uh, of course, <laughs> I don't know. Like looking back, like it was my breakthrough tournament, right? And then I had a couple of good tournaments, and then it just went downhill. Like it, it went from, like it went from me. I, I remember, like, after Cluj, I was so hyped, you know. Everyone was so hyped on me as well. I turned on my stream without camera, 5,000 viewers. Like, like thing was okay. popping, you know. I was so yeah, hyped, yeah. right? And then, like, I started playing dog shit, and everything just went so south. And uh, I don't know I don't know the reason for it, honestly. Like, And I don't know my role. Like, that was probably the biggest problem was because I didn't have a role. Like, I tried everything. Legit everything. And it, I, I don't think I even found my role before I went to Renegades, you know, in 2018. Before that, there was no roles for me. Like, I tried everything. One thing I want to ask about was the Cluj tournament because I'm actually not going to skip to the end like everyone else does. Everyone says the classic line of how many rounds you were from the fight. We all know that one. Yeah, and no. Listen, I'm, don't worry. Everyone who didn't win a major yet in CSGO who was in that team knows very well how many fucking rounds you were from the fight. Like, you don't need to tell them that. But the story they all miss is this. Dude, you guys beat Virtus Pro in the playoffs of a fucking major. Like, that's no joke. Like, mate, that, that was, the, if people don't know, even if they weren't the best, that was like the scariest team to play. Like, that's the team that might just smash you for no reason. Like, what did you? What was this match like, mate? It was on. It was a playoff match at a major. You beat these guys. Yeah, I, it, it's one of the biggest moments of my career, I would say, uh, because of course, 
you know when you're when you're reaching playoffs, you know like which teams you don't want to play and what teams you would like. Can we please, you know, get them? And at the time, I think maybe we wanted Luminosity, even though they turned out to sure. be this insane team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the teams we didn't want was Fnatic and Envy because they played like very like individual and it didn't really suit us. But I think VP always suit us in a bit because we were playing individual and they were playing like a team. So like, I think it, it wasn't that bad of a, of a matchup. But of course, like we were heavy underdogs and we had like a really really good game. But it was I don't know. It was it was a uh, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 that was legit. I remember that was legit. You know, like beating them, these legends it was like a really big uh, moment of my career. And then obviously, yes, there was the match against the Envy team that went on to win the major, where there was a round. If you win this round, you would have been in the final. Look, no one knows what would happen against Navi, but even so, yeah. that was like, you. Were, if people don't know, you were on, the, the joke is, this is why the G2 run looked epic, because the side of the bracket you were on were, in theory, all the best teams. It was just mm-hmm. TSM on the other side that was supposed to meet you. You had Envy and Fnatic and Verts. Like, the joke is, you're the only team that's not meant to make it out of that side of the bracket. So what, what was this match like? Was it one you remember? Yeah, this was actually like versus VP. I felt like uh, we could win it, but versus Envy, I was like, "Fuck, this one is gonna be hard," you know. And I think if I don't remember 100% wrong, like we stumped them on the first map, like on those two, like 16 eight or some shit. And I was like, "Fuck, we're actually making it," you know. And then uh, yeah, I don't know. Envy was a team I never liked to play against, even though you knew that Happy was gonna fucking go alone one side and bait the rest of them. <laughs> it was fucking hard to play against them, you know. Kenny was insane and and you know they had so many good players uh, I, I never liked to play against them and i i well, i wouldn't say that i didn't believe that we could beat them but i definitely had like it it might end here you know this might be the last game yeah right obviously like we've touched on there then there became the period i mean it wasn't that much longer it was g2 then it became phase clan but it was the same basic team yeah. where the problem with this team like i said was i always think actually it made people at the beginning it was too hyped because you had these runs when you had dennis and people thought wow they should do all these things and then because famously the team used to never get out the group like you might you'd usually even win the first game like at the b one you'd win like a match oh they could do it here and then somehow it would never happen you'd never go to the playoffs i actually think it made everyone go the other way and start thinking all the players sucked and Everyone's terrible because the problem with Counter Strike is like football. If you don't have the right team and the right structure, mate, unless you really are Ronaldo or something, you're gonna look shit. Like it's yeah. not many people can just hard carry. Like and in these in this scenario, actually, it feels like people. I think this is one of the first teams where it's almost like how people are treating EG now. People like because they knew because Faze, you get paid loads of money. It was like they get paid all this money and then they all suck and they're all just arrogant and they don't care about the game. But as we say, you didn't have an in-game leader. Like you, you had a, you had a very unusual structure, right? And I doubt in a team like that with Faze, I doubt you can just say like the old days, kick this guy, get this guy in. It's more like bloody. It's like how much to sign this guy and then do we kick this guy? It's not, it's not as simple, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's always much more to it than the, the public sees and. But when we went to face, it was a split decision in the team because I think Michael and AC was because we had brought in AC at the time. They were pushing hard for face. Me and Fox was pushing hard to stay at G2, and then Rain was kind of in between. As I remember, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure it was like that. And people think that we were be- being paid like shit loads of money in face. We were we were offered a double in G2 to stay, and people okay. don't know. Yeah, we were offered a double, and I was like. Like, for me, that was there for, like, two, three months and has made this, like, okay salary in G2, like, livable salary, and then had, like, a sh- big offer. I was like, why the fuck would we leave, you know, for this? Like, and then I'm not going to... What was the logic for the others to want to leave then? Because this is this is so fucked up, but we had so many meetings. There was this person from Norway that was in face. I don't oh, know if yes. you know... Yeah. yeah, I remember. This fucking dog. I, I, I hate him, <laughs> dead honest. He, he kind of, like, he tricked a couple of people. And and um, he was always like, if you guys come to face, your brand is going to explode. All the money you're going to make, like salary is just going to be pennies compared to what you're going to make of brand deals, blah, blah, okay. blah, blah. I was like, yeah, it sounds too Smooth good to be customer, true. Smooth customer, yeah. Yeah, like I'm happy where I am and the good salary they're offering me sounds like a good deal, you know. We And I felt like G2 had our back. They were trusting in us, you know. They wanted us to stay. Like Carlos really wanted us to stay. I don't know. I, I was not happy with the decision, but I'm not saying that like it was a bad decision. Because like when we entered FaZe, FaZe was a really good org. I liked the guys. Like they did nothing but good to me, you know. I just didn't deliver. That was just me. Uh, but did I wish that I could go back in time and stay at G2 together with the guys? Yes, I wish, you know. 
One thing I want to do is ask about a few of the players at this time, because as I say, I think a lot of them actually like it, it tanked their stock a little bit. So you mentioned one of them, Maisie. He also mm. was someone who, when he came to, the whole reason he came into G2, if people don't know, is because he was just going mental when he was, in fact, that clues the poker tournament. The joke is, I think they only played like two maps and he has some absurd score, mate. He just does like this 1v5 with a deagle in first pro. Like, he was fucking insane at that time. If people don't know, he was very talented. And sadly now, because he played so many years in North, like his MSL's like support pal or something, people think he's shit and he had like no skills like the AZ you met in that team even in this team he was pretty good right yeah yeah I, the only problem I think we had uh, regarding changing Dennis to AC was because we were just used to playing like on the fly no IGL and he came from a really structured team with MSL so right. he didn't he did not like the way we were playing so we were facing difficulties with like vision of the game how we should play very early with AC in the team so then that's when we were like, we needed a coach. I think we maybe have uh, Robin from before, but I can't remember. And then we needed an IGL. Like it, stuff started to happen, you know, because he wanted to play different and we were open to change. But we By the were way, like, yeah, go on. Yeah, I mean, that, that was basically the case with him. Like there was never any doubt of skill or anything, <coughs> but I just think that like, he really hated the way that we were playing. And then the other one is now the notorious Kiyoshima, who obviously at this time, Swally, he was on that MV team that won the championship. But obviously what's happened in his career is because in his career, it's never he's playing bad in the game. You watch the Devils, he's a pretty good player. But then he just gets kicked and then it's always like he's kicked and it's like, but we can't say the reason why. And it's like, that's made it more mysterious. Or anything. I've heard behind the scenes, it's just that. Like, spoiler, I'll even give you some info that people might know publicly. He was someone who also on the side used to play a bunch of poker and definitely was a little bit more, more wild than some of the others even if he seemed nerdy he obviously had at the time like a literal model girlfriend that everyone knew about in the scene he was like the original device in some ways mate like he had this whole like extra life going on and he was a very good player in Counter Strike so what I've heard is basically he was just someone where he could be a bit lazy in practice or maybe he's a little bit argumentative I didn't hear anything like super toxic or anything but what was the I thought he was good in this team so what, what was the what was it like playing with Kishima were there any issues was there a reason he had to be the one who eventually was moved out I don't know. I, I can't 100% remember everything that was going on in that team, but he was definitely... He liked to argue. He, or like He liked to get his case, like his side of the case. But I don't think he was toxic or anything. I don't think... I can't remember him being lazy either. The only thing that I can't remember that people was a little bit annoyed with was, you know, like a, a little bit of a baiter in game. I think okay. that's, that is like, you know, when someone... Sometimes you just need to fucking go. And I don't give a shit who goes first. Just... Like, if there is a timing, we take it, we go. And I don't give a shit if you're Lurker or IGL or Entry or whatever. And I don't think he had the same vision as maybe some other players. And I remember, like, the things that I remember there is... Because uh, I think we were bringing in Kerrigan, right? And it was between me and Ky me and Kyushima. Yes. And I didn't know about this. There was one of us was going to be cut. And and then Rain comes to me and say, like, uh, we want to keep you. Like, he has obviously fought hard for me, I guess. We've mm -hmm. always been good friends. And they wanted to keep me because, you know, I was left selfish, I guess. And even though it wasn't really working. Um, and that was basically like, uh, so Kiyoshima was uh, cut or benched? Uh, benched, I think, yeah. And then after, like, everyone thought that I was going to be, like, that I was cut, you know. But I actually, at some point, I was just so <coughs> sick. Like, I, I was sick of uh, traveling, playing dog shit, not having a role, trying everything. Like, nothing was working for me. And I guess at the time, maybe I gave up a bit early, but it just wasn't working. So I actually went back to, I think it was Robon at the time, and I said, bring Kyushima back into team. I will bench myself. I just can't do this anymore. So I was never, never kicked from them, but I would, my, my, my name was definitely coming up, you know. Yes. I, didn't, I, was, I was on, uh, <laughs> like I didn't have much time left, that's for sure. And then the other guy actually is Robin, because if people don't know, when you had him as your coach, was the weird year where actually the coach could be sort of the IGL, he could talk the whole time, and famously, Starix did it in Na'Vi, and I think like later Peacemaker did it in like Team Liquid or something. There was a few teams where this was the real strategy. So what I actually wondered was, I heard at one point in time, Robin did this for FaZe, right? I, I, think it was, I think he was trying a little bit, yeah. I think his, he, uh, like FaZe was his first team uh, as a coach, and his only, I guess. Um... But I think uh, he was not up to date with CS uh, Go. He was right. more like 1.6. So sure. I don't think he like had that insane of knowledge at the start of the game. But he definitely has now, of course. I mean, he's been been in phase for so many years, and he's definitely doing something right because they're keeping him. And I always liked Robin as well, even though like he was not like this. He was not going to call the winning thing. He was not going to come with an insane strat. You know, he was always very good at keeping. You know, even though he was going shit, people 
people needed to be, you know, respectful to each other. We needed to have a good light mood in the group. Like he was very important there. But I, I don't think he was like an IGL for us, like very right. long. Maybe maybe a small period. Because that was the thing I was going to ask about. Because now, because he has he's been with Carrigan for so long, and everyone knows Carrigan is like the guy who calls wherever he wants on the fly, anytime he wants. The perception of Robin is like, oh, he's, he just doesn't know anything about the game, does he? He just stands. He's just Carrigan's like mate who does like do that. And it's like maybe Carrigan said something. I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about. But Robin definitely knows Counter Strike. And like you're saying, one thing that's put, I think he brings as, as a coach that's good is he is the ultimate example of like a veteran. When that guy talks, he doesn't have to like convince you. It's like you just know yeah. by the way he speaks and holds himself. Like he's a legit. You know he's been around. He's been in those finals. He's been in the matches, right? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I remember, like, I had a lot of respect for him because I was always watching uh, the one point six finals, etc., etc. And he, I knew he was like, and and I believed him when he was talking, you know, because sometimes CS is just about the fucking basics, you know, like, and he was always about the basics, like uh, trade each other, run together, like all these basics. And it's like very easy for someone to say, but he was usually always right and. And there's a reason why Kerrigan brought him back, you know. Like, Kerrigan would never... Like, I, I played under Kerrigan as well, and, and he's an amazing IGL. And there's no doubt that Kerrigan would bring him back if it wasn't if he wasn't really good for the team. So, yeah, I, I, I always respected Robon, always liked him, and I still think that he's doing a really good job at FaZe. I'm 100% sure. And his knowledge is, of course, much higher now than it was with us because he has been out of the game for, you know, quite a while. One other thing was during this time, just before you got Carrigan, was when you had all those tournaments. Where, like I say, the playoffs never happened, but the most the epic one because it was just like if you remember, this was ESL Cologne where you got the group of death. Where oh, the group yeah. was like SK Gaming, best team in the world. G two was just fucking beating SK Gaming and won like a LAN. Fnatic, <laughs> yeah, Fnatic, like with all all the fights, and then your team, and it's like me. And but remember, only two teams are getting out of this group because yeah. one thing I even remember about this, right? This is what I want to ask you about. Was famously when you guys like in the B or one, I think you beat Fnatic or upset yeah, them or did, some shit. Did, yeah. So when you did that, right? Because it meant that, like, logically, like, I think G2 and Fnatic, one of them, like, couldn't get out at this point or something. I did some, like, edgy tweet that was like, oh, thanks, Faze, for fucking up the whole group, you know? Because my whole thing was like, you're not going to do anything in the playoffs. And I remember Rain just, like, replied and was just like, fuck you or something, right? <laughs> and what's mad is, at the time, I thought, like, oh, maybe Faze is actually, they think they're going to do it. Okay, they're getting a bit cocky. And then, obviously, you guys didn't make it. So, but then I saw you at the event and it's like, mate, you look like someone shot your dog or something. So I was thinking, like, what was going through everyone's heads at this time? Like, did you, did the team actually really believe, like, we can actually do it and get out of this group was it like oh no. fuck we'll try i guess <laughs> oh that was that was pain when we got the group 100 percent. you know you wait for cologne every year and then you get that fucking group but you gotta you gotta say it you gotta say that you believe you gotta you know try to fool yourself that you believe but looking back i don't think we were fucking believing that we could get out of that group of course winning the best of one gave if i don't remember wrong it's like win one best of one you win one more best of one you're fucking out of the group yes win, you know yeah so and the loser match or the elimination match was best of three. Yep. Or was it, yeah. So winning the first match definitely gave us a chance. You know, all you need to do is just deliver one more good best of one. But I don't think we really believe that, you know, we could we could get out of that group. Um, I, I think that's just, you know, you put on a, a mask. Here's the thing. That story, which everyone now always forgets, is it's not like Carrigan chose to come. They just kicked him out of Astralis. By the way, his own team that he'd made with all those players. Like, and when they kicked him out, that thing is, though, if you're on the other side and you hear, like, oh, we can get Carrigan, like, that's an instant yes, right? That's like, yeah, bring him now. Bring him over immediately. And people don't know the story, dude. Didn't he join, like... They just basically like flew to Atlanta to come to E League, and then he just started playing E League season one and got through the group. Like, I don't think there even was like a boot camp or any sort of practice or something. Was there? Uh, there was definitely no boot camp, but I think maybe there was like two, three days of practice. Okay, because, because, still pretty like, wild. No, 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 I do remember some some crazy stuff happening in those practices. Like, I'm not going to go into details here because I don't want to call out someone. <laughs> <Okay>. but... <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think he was shocked about our mentality the first days. I'll I'll, give, I'll say as much as that because we were fucking, we were on the moon. <laughs> it was fucked up. I, I, I like when Carrion came in. At least that was the first time I would say that I played for a top team with a real leader and some fucking structure. I had a couple of good games, but I feel like I was I was just too much down mentally, confidence wise. I couldn't get myself out of it. You know. But I think, uh, I think I don't know. I, I always respect him a lot. I remember he was trying and... Yeah. I don't know. He was, he was good for us. And you can see, like, all the success he's had, of course, with FaZe. 
How would you describe his calling style? Because I think in your team especially is why he became famous. Because before you had the Australis call, you had really good players as well. And obviously they did other... But with your team, because at the time no one made international teams, or at least they weren't the best. It was always teams where it's like, this guy's from Norway, he's no other team, this guy's from oh. Belgium, and he's not in the... In your team, like uh, people saw immediately like his style's working. So what was his style of calling? I think uh, <laughs> like everyone thinks that you need to have like this insane amount of set, uh, uh, tactics and all these strats and all that. But he was like, of course, we had that as well. But he would just make them on the fly sometimes. It was just 20 seconds of freeze time where he explained like five rolls. And it was just, we've never heard about it before. But it was just a good call because he had a, a good vision of this would work, you know. So I remember, that I think I played with him for like three months maybe. And it was very on the fly. I don't know if he still calls like very on the fly. But what I remember, it was like, and I've never experienced it since. That's the thing. Like, he, I think for, for me and all the IGLs I've had, he has a very unique way of calling. And uh, because like a lot of people, you know, they talk about it before the game, in, in round number three, if we win pistol and antique, we're going to do this uh, tactic, it's set, it's planned. But he, I don't know, I don't think he was ever like that with us. I don't know, I, I, uh, he has a very unique style, I would say. The other thing as well I've noticed that people now have picked up on when I pointed it out is... He's so, you know, normally, I mean, I, some IGLs, even some really good ones, they are really like, right, we're going to work on this map as our home map. Once we've got that nailed, we're going to expand to this. Like, his whole shit's like, right, we're just going to start playing four or five immediately. And even in the veto, you know what? I might come back from that veto huddle and be like, yeah, boys, we're playing Cobble, all this and that. You're like, what the fuck? What? I thought we were practicing Mirage. Like, is it is that what it's like to be with him? I don't I don't 100% remember, but he definitely, we were definitely not just playing one map, you know, and focusing on that. We were, he was coming in and he was just like, he would just lead us on the fly in the start before we didn't, because we didn't have time to practice, as you said, like we were going straight into tournaments and we just had full trust. Like, I think he asked, I think he said, one of the first thing he said, like, even if you think I make a shit call, I don't give a shit. You follow the call, you trust me 100% because that's the only way we're going to win together. Like, because if we start questioning his calls, if we start like doubting or not following, then we're going to lose, you know, because I've, I think that's just how basic CS is, you know. And uh, I don't know, I think he asked for that. Like, never question my calls. And <laughs> okay, I, I, I kind of agree, you know. Like, it's quite, it's quite cool to have someone say that. A lot of people give up the responsibility, right? I you think, want him I think, to be like, do what I say. Uh, because I think we had, like, nothing set, you know. We had no, like, we had no time. And I think at that time, like, if he called fucking B-Rush, he thinks it's a good call, we just rush B. Don't say, like, ah, nah, that's not good, you know. Like, if, because every player has had players in the team that has been like the one that kind of questions the caller of course and, and then you then you start having you know internal issues in the team and uh, i have i don't think i've ever questioned any callers call because it's his fucking job you know you listen to him i don't know i, I liked him I, I think i think if i don't remember 100 percent wrong though like I, I don't think i'm remembering wrong i think i'm 100 percent right but i remember that he was saying that just fucking listen to me one thing I had to allude to earlier, like even in this team, you still had your ups and your downs, was I remember, I can't remember the specific match, but it was when I was at E-League, I think it was E-League season two when Carrigan just came in. I remember there was like a, a game, it could have been season one as well, it was one of the E-League tournaments for sure, because I remember doing the actual, you know when you do like after each map on the analyst desk, so the problem with that is naturally you end up doing, everything's a hot take, isn't it? The guy who top frags on one map, it's like, see, this is why he's a great player, and you did this, right? You had one game, I think it was like, I can't remember what map it was, you had one game where you popped off, you had like 27 kills or 30 kills. And so we we went on the desk and we obviously had to be like, this is why they kept him from clues. You know, they believed in him. And, I was, and then I think you know where the story's going. And then in the next map, I'm not joking, you might have had like three frags or something. It was like, holy shit, bloody hell. You know, it was one of those ones. Like, because that was what your game was like. It could just be mad up and down, right? It was fucking up and down. There was no consistency. I, I think I remember. I think it was Overpass versus C9 where I popped off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was like elimination match or like a match to reach the playoffs or something like that. Or like win the group, but I can't remember it. And then I, I don't remember the, the, the three frags one, but it, I definitely had a couple of them in face. Sure. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, it, it was rough times. I think I also remember Dreamhack, Bucharesti or whatever. We played like a best of three versus, uh, I think it was Dignitas at the time. And we lost 2-0 and I had a total of nine frags in two maps. And I remember I had an eco ace where they rushed ramp. I had P90. <laughs> oh, that's even worse. You, what, it, I was one round. Just half that, was like over, that was legit over 50% of the frags. It was a fucking <laughs> that's even worse. Ace. <laughs> and I remember the fly of the played back. I was like, "Holy shit! If I don't lose my job, then I don't know what I'm. I don't know. God is saving me, I guess." 
how would you actually handle, by the way, if something like that happens? Because in that kind of a case, like as you're saying, it sounds like because you hadn't, until you got to Carrigan, you hadn't really had like a lot of structure around you. You hadn't had like a set in game. So in that scenario, you just left to yourself to figure it out, right? There's not really anyone helping you in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day, there was no like structure at all around it. And I think it, like I'm laughing of it now because, you know, I am a much more mature and grown man now. But back then, like I went from the G2 days where like everyone like this fucking young kid, he's a god, blah, blah, blah into like this fucking dog, you know, he can't kill anyone. And that was mentally really tough. Uh, I think after phase days, I went into like depression as well. Like it was, it was getting that bad, you know? And uh, I don't know, it was tough as fuck. Like right now I laugh of it, but back, back, back then I was definitely not laughing of it, you know? Like it, it was so fucking, it was tough as fuck. And if people don't know, it's not like after the phase period, you just went straight to another tier, you picked that. There was like a while you were out of the game and it wasn't even implied. Like, because I've seen that people have done some, I've, I know when I talked to, I think I did an interview with Kassad where he talked about this, about how even when you lived in with Renegades in America, you were actually the guy who was always on like a Skype call or something with your family and you'd constantly be trying to stay in contact and all that sort of stuff. It, basically, wasn't it implied like you went, you just went home and kind of like licked your wounds and saw if you were going to be a CS player again? What, what were you doing for the rest of that year? Yeah, kind of, I guess. Yes, I, I think uh, I remember at the time when I benched myself. I was still living because we were never home. Uh, we were always traveling, etc. So I just didn't have any apartment. I was just staying at my mom's home, uh, mom and dad's uh, house. And then I was like, okay, well, that didn't really work out. Now I need to figure out, but I need some time to just, you know, reflect a bit. So I just got my own apartment. I moved out. And then eventually, I don't think I questioned if I would come back or not because I had some offers. But I just wanted to, I wanted to be sure that this is a team that I want to be in because the last, the last maybe three, four, five months of phase, like I wasn't feeling, like I was like, you couldn't wait for a day off, you couldn't wait for the fucking weekend, you know, like you just wanted time off, and I don't want to feel that again. So I just wanted to be hundred percent sure. I don't think I, I, like I said, I had a couple of offers, so I knew that I would be back, but I just needed to be it to be the right one, and it ended up with us making dignitas. With yes. people I was comfortable, you know, with, even though it didn't really work out either. Thing is, I actually heard, because I did my interview with Sonny, he said he was supposed to be in that team with you guys. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But It sounds like if he could have been in the team, it might have been different. I mean, we're looking at Sonny back in the day, I think he was in Penta at the time, yeah. and he was mad fragging. And we wanted him. I don't know where he went, if he went from Penta to Mouse. or, or I think he did. He did, yeah. <clears throat> so I guess like he got a better offer towards the end because we were close with him. And he was keen to join as well. And I... Like, like the thing I remember was like we made the core. The three of us was like me, Fox, Rubino, or was it Michael? I can't remember honestly. I think, I think it was Rubino. Mike. Yeah, okay. We, and I think we removed Michael pretty early because it didn't really work out. But anyway, like there was like we wanted. Like I remember Sunny. Uh, we would have a bunch of like fraggers at the time, like good players, you know. And I think it would have been different, but we just ended up, you know, when when you want a player, you can't get him, and then you're like, "Fuck, uh, let's see, uh, let's just get this guy." And that's kind of where we ended up in Dignitas. A lot of times, just getting one guy because we need someone. I guess he can do an alright job. And you know, like <laughs> if you're trying to do some damage, then you know it's not going to work out. If we skip then to after the period off to when you come to Renegades. Right, you have to explain that to me because it's just fucking yeah. Team Australians. I was, I was a guy from Norway and up in a Team Australians yeah. having a live in America. Something weird was happened there. Ah, uh, that that is uh, it. It was uh, it's weird for me as well, honestly. Like thinking back about it, like back then I was like that was after Dignitas days, and I was just sitting in Norway and I was like, I think I'm gonna go back to normal work. Like fucking CS was fun, but maybe I'm I'm not strong enough. It wasn't meant for me. I'm not good enough. Like I was at that point, you know. And then uh, randomly, I think it was like fucking three in the morning for me. Like, you know, no sleep schedule, no nothing, just fucking playing and having fun. Then I get a message from, I don't know, I know it was Casa and Gomez writing, but I can't remember who it was, which account. They just messaged me and said like, hey, would you be interested to come to Detroit in America to live there for three months and play two, three tournaments? And I was like, what the fuck? I guess, I guess, yeah, let's, let's try. And I jumped on the call with their like manager he made a contract for like six months. He was like, I'm going to be nice with you. You're going to get six months. Guaranteed, even though it was just for three months. So I was like, fuck it. I didn't give a shit how much I was paid. I just flew down and was like, this is my last shot. I'm going to give it all. And I don't know. It was uh, when I came to Detroit. I, the, the thing is, I had no idea. Detroit, where the fuck is that? Like I knew it was in America, right? 
and I, and I left February. There was early February. It was snowy. It was rainy. It was dark in Norway. And I was like, oh, nice. I'm going to go to America. Sun, you know. I, I travel over. I meet the same shit. Fucking winter, snow. I was like, there's no shot. But anyway, like, I, I entered the house. Everyone's very open. And we just started playing. I went to a couple of... <coughs> the reason why they only put me for like three months was because they had a deal or like very close to a deal with the Bentet from Tyler at the time. He was going to come and be their like player. They just needed someone to fill in. And I remember we flew to Katowice. I don't know, didn't do that good, but like we played all right, won a game, lost the elimination game. Went to Stalader in Kiev, came to yep. quarterfinal, lost to Optic, and we flew back to America. And I was like, fuck, should I really fly back to America when I'm going to go home anyway? And we sit down in the ring and they were like, do you want to sign a full-time contract? We want you to stay. And I was like, fuck yes, you know, this was because I enjoyed playing with them. Different culture, different guys, they're very chill, kind of like how I want it. And and then all of a sudden, you know, we did a couple more roster changes and we turned into a fucking tier one team at some point. And I don't know, it was one hell of a journey, I guess. But uh, like out of nowhere, like I was kind of, CS were kind of dead to me, you know, didn't even follow it at the time. The all funny the thing is, yeah. what you say there, about, specifically the style of the was what I was going to reference. Because the funny thing is, you're right, to you, that's like, I mean, all we did is make quarters and lose. But actually, that was the one, if people don't remember, that was one more stacked style as ever. It was the full Swiss system one. You guys had to be like fanatic and stuff to get out the group. Like, actually, to the Renegades guys, to be in the playoffs, they were like a phase team. They were the one who could get like an upset, but they never go deep in a tournament. Like, yeah, I yeah. actually think that's that was a sign to them. Like, hey, fuck, maybe we should stick with this lineup. Like, we're actually going somewhere. And I think you had to play like phase in the first round anyway. So it's like, it wasn't, I don't think it was even like like an unreasonable team you lost to. Like I think actually they thought like we've got a good team now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and we had like such a good chemistry, like a different chemistry that I'm, that I've ever felt anywhere else. Like I don't know what it what it was that was clicking, but it was just working. And I would say it was still working, even though we didn't like have like crazy results in the start. But it was just because like I, I felt that you know we all were there to try at least. Not like no one had gave up, no one. And it didn't take as long as well because, like, we felt like some of us wanted to take it further than others. And then we just did a couple of roster changes, and you know, like, it was it was fucking good. I don't know. I, I, I'm I was, also yeah, go on. I was gonna say I think it, it might be my best days of CS, honestly, the Renegades days. Yeah. No, that's just one thing I want to ask about because the other thing is as well. Whether someone designed it or not, you can tell me, but it seems like this is where you found like your actual role in Counter Strike. I mean, people are just going to describe it loosely as like entry, but obviously, sometimes you lurk on the other side of the map or whatever. How would you describe what you did? Because I think this is basically where like the Jacob role got set. Yeah, 100%. I think uh, the, the, the fucked up thing in the very start was when I flew in, I was told when I landed in the airport, I wasn't in, in a taxi with Nifty and someone else. And they were like, we're going to copy the, the Luminosity or SK. I can't remember what team they were at the time, but the Brazilians. Copy the playstyle, and you're going to be called Sarah. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? All right. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I It's a hell of a line, again. right? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, go, here we go again, you know? Okay. <laughs> and then they, take, they took them like a week. They were like, you're way too aggressive to be called Sarah. We need to do something <laughs> yes. else. Okay. Uh, and then we just swapped some roles. And uh, and I think it, it, like, it didn't take many weeks. And Casa was like, fuck this SK thing. We need to find our own... Uh, I, th- I don't think it was Casa's idea even to like get this SK luminosity thing. I think that was Nifty's IGL that wanted to do that, and Casa just shut it down pretty early. Like if we just gave it a try, but it didn't work out. But I think Casa definitely he saw what type of players I was and what I liked, you know, and he just defined my role and put me as an entry. And I think I don't know, and not only as an entry, like you need to play city side as well. In like I was in all aggressive positions, you know, because right. I like early fights, I like this chaos, you know, all this type of stuff. And with, with the system we had at the time, like he put me in all those positions. So even though there was a lot of like rushing in and dying and you know on T side, at least I got to play all the good positions on CT. Right. Because so that's like also it- the other thing, by the way, about anyone who plays any kind of an entry position. You have to really be able to trust those teammates because they can make you look so fucking bad if they don't follow up. If they don't like yeah, if, if you die instantly and they just back off, you, you make you look silly, right? Your score's gonna look shit. Yeah, I mean that is the worst. As an entry fragger, if the if the people because like the the rules I've heard in every team is like the first guy going in should never be the one taking care of the spacing of the trading. The people behind should just make sure they're fucking close or tell him to wait. Like it's just that simple, right? And uh, I don't know. In Renegades, like they, we had no problems with it. They were like, if, if they saw me running, they would run in with me and die. No questions asked. They don't give a shit. If And it was also like, if you think that I am doing a stupid play, just do the stupid play with me, you know? 
and uh, and yeah, I don't know. But I see, like, if you think about other entry fraggers at the time, like, you, I can just bring up Taco as an example, you know, like, struggling because he was just rushing first on T-side, and then he had to stay on Mirage and jump spot B. Like, if I had to do that, I, I don't know, like, that would be fucking miserable. That player should be bottom of the scoreboard, just like... Yeah, I, I mean, you're forcing <laughs> yeah, him at the bottom, you know? Like, you're not giving yes. him a chance to be anywhere else at the bottom. So at least, like, they gave me, like, all the good city positions. So I, I didn't really complain about, you know, rushing and dying in T. The I only problem with this era of the team, though, was obviously, like, eventually there was the swap from Nifty to Azza and the different... Because the problem was this team, it's like, it got to that level where it's like, now it's a playoff team, you can maybe win a game in the playoffs, but there was, like, a cap, wasn't it? They couldn't get past... Like, you weren't going to beat, like, a top-four team in the world. You weren't going to make the semi-finals. Like, something was holding the team back a bit, right? 100%, and I think there was... Uh, <clears throat> I start, Like, not at the start, but towards, like, two, three, four months into the team, I could feel there was a little bit tension between some people, some players. And I would say Nifty was definitely one of them that I looked at as maybe the, the biggest issue in the team because he had the biggest ego. Because especially after that, like, 50 game as well on Earl uh, versus Mouse in, in Sydney. And, it, it, like, it came to the point where, like, everyone gets wanted to do changes. They didn't know if they wanted to do one or two, but most likely two. And, uh, and Nifty was, like, trying to, like... He had, like, 15 different solutions, but all of them was, like, kicking two other players. And then I was like, fuck, is no one else interested in just kidding, kicking him? Like, legit. And then all of a sudden, like, he was going to envy anyways, like, out of nowhere. And we were like, okay, that's good. Because I think at the time, like, the rest of us agreed that I think we should kick him. And, like, he was trying to kick all of the others, you know? Uh, but there was definitely a little bit of tension between someone. Not not with me, but between some of the other people that has been in the team for longer. So I think, like, when we kicked him, which was like the IGL in a big part of the team, you kind of, you, you you need to like start from scratch, you know, and build it again. You just build it properly this time. And I think that was the right uh, player to remove. And then the other player we removed was uh, Justillo. I mean, it, it was like, who else, you know? Like, I mean, you, so sometimes, you know, it, it just, it just have to be a player. And it was an easy player to, to cut, even though like, he was probably everyone's best mate in the team. Yes. He was... Uh, Super and, chill guy, right? Yeah, but that, that's what makes it tough sometimes. But that's just, you know, <laughs> you, you, you need to think uh, th- th- this is a business as well, you know. It's not it's not only about friends. So, uh, yeah, it, it's always tough to kick people, but it was it was a really good decision. I think the decision-making we did with removing those two and bringing in two others were, were key to the success, honestly. One of the things that I always thought was wild about this was the actual, in theory, the lesson of Renegades at that point, like recruiting you and Nifty in theory, was like, don't just keep getting Australian players. Yeah. Like, you had a few of them. You got the good ones. You got like Azza and JK. You got the good ones. Now let's, you know, we can go international. We got JK. And the joke was, it looked like they were going backwards because they were like, right, we've got these guys though. And we're like, who the fuck? Like, I guess we vaguely remember them from like, I am Sydney or something. Like, what, how did they sell you on these guys? Did you yeah. know they were good? I don't, I don't know what, how much I should say, but <laughs> we I don't take any credit. We as a, as a team, as, as players, we should get no credit for, for bringing in those two. And right now, it, it sounds like I will credit the Renegades guys, but <laughs> we were like, we were told like, hey, yeah, so two guys from Australia is uh, flying over in a bit. Uh, Greatest Factor and Leos. We were like, oh, checking them up. What the fuck is that? You know? <laughs> exactly. And, and the fucked up thing is like, when, they, when those two came to the, to the fucking house we lived in, they opened the door and they were like, Jake him. Fuck, we were told that it was you still a plane. And I was like, what? <laughs> they thought you thought you were caught. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I didn't think, but those, those two were thinking that, that, that it was going to be a full Australia, you know. No right. more international. So, like, that's that's how poor the communication was at the time. But we were like, all right, fuck it. Let's just go, you know. I guess we're like, this is the org we represent and they pay our salary. But we, we are still a group, you know. Fuck the, like, fuck, fuck the people that don't communicate with us, honestly. It, it like... It's kind of mind blowing looking back at it that they don't know who they are playing with, flying overseas, and we don't know who's coming in. Like we we have no say either. But it worked out, so now they look like geniuses. But yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's it's a bit wild. The other thing as well to me in that scenario is, even though it took a few months to get going, this is also a team where like this a team had amazing chemistry, right? Yeah, hundred percent. It's uh, I don't know, like. Like, fucking all of them, like, I look at as brothers. Usually you have, like, these one or two guys who are like, yeah, they're all right, but, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't cry if, you know, I'm not playing with them anymore. 
but in this team, like this was, we were we were legit like so close to each other. It didn't matter like who was together. It wasn't any like specific groups in the team. We were just a fucking team, and and it was a really good feeling to be a part of that. The one tournament, like obviously later we'll go to the Berlin one, but I would ask about the kind of eight one because if anyone goes on Liquipedia, you're not going to get the full story. You're going to see like fifth to eighth at the major. You're going to that's pretty good, like not bad. <laughs> no, this team should have beaten SK Gaming. You've been in the semi finals against Astralis, right? This was the t- this should have been the first top four. Like this would have been it, right? The team I was primed for it. Mm-hmm. And and the, and the way to get there was also crazy. So the story would be just like insane. Like we went back to Australia to play a close qualifier. We didn't even win it. We came second. We lost to Greyhound, and like we were like, ah, maybe, maybe it's it's a little bit rough again, boys. And then we just ended up as like fifth to eighth, which was our like best placing at the time as a team, but definitely with potential to bring it further, you know. And and they, that SK team was not in the best position either. But I guess like looking back, it was an amazing run, but maybe we were like too satisfied too early, you know. Because we went, like like I said, we went back to Australia, played a close twal- qualifier, then back to Poland, boot camping for a full month, then uh, H&RMR, win that one, and then another stage, another stage, and then Legend stage and playoffs. Like, we were in so many stages. I think we were in Poland for three months. And, and like, imagine staying in the same country for three months for one tournament, you know? And it was one hell of a run. I'm not saying anything else, but it was... Uh, I wish it went further as well. And, and like, like you said, like, SK... Were they SK or MIBR? MIBR. They, um, no, they, I think they were SK still, and they became MIBR just afterwards. Fuck, I, I feel like I remember they had, like, yellow jerseys. Maybe SK. Oh, had here's yet. the thing. They might have been fucking with SK the Org at the time yeah. and not wearing the SK jerseys. I think there was some shit like that maybe uh, going on. So I wouldn't put it past them. Let's be real. But they're definitely a team that we could, uh, could have taken down, in my opinion. So, yeah. It could have been the magic run, honestly. One thing you've touched on a few times here, which again, people don't know about the Renegade story that makes it so epic, is not only is the team always potentially breaking up if you have the bad results, but like the implication constantly is like the Orgs just going to pull out. They're going to fire everyone. Like, because it's spent a lot of money, you know, everyone has to live in America the whole time. Like, I'm sure they want massive results and they think they're going to win tournaments and stuff. Like, what, what is it, how do you manage this? Because that could be stressful, right? If that's in the back of your mind, like we've got to do well at this tournament. Yeah, 100%. But I feel like it's a part of the pressure. And I feel uh, at some point, even I think that was even with Justillo and Nifto, honestly, where we re-signed with Renegades, we all were in the same salary, same contract length, same contracts. Like, you feel a little bit more safe then. And like, you just put something in your in your contract that, let's say if you get cut, you have, you know, six months of salary or whatever. So you have something guaranteed. And then like, the pressure is a little bit less, I guess. But I know, like... <laughs> I, don't, I mean, the pressure is always with you, unless you are some fucking amazing player, you know, like if you're an eco or you're a simple or if you have like, even even if they have like a tournament where they kill zero people, you know, like no one is going to cut them, right? So f- for us, that is like more fighting, you know, to be, to, to reach the top, it, it, the pressure is always there. Like, like I feel, you always feel shit after like bombing out or what does the org think now? Like, how do they look at the team? Or you play like an unbelievable bad tournament. They're like, oh my God, like what is going on there? So I feel like, but, but but you get used to it, honestly. Like, I didn't really think that much about it. Because I think I changed my mindset. Like I said, like, when I was in phase, everything went downhill. I read every comment about me. Like, that's when it gets tough. But you, I feel like you just get a little bit stronger and you start not giving a shit at some point. Like, you just do it your way. And if it works, amazing. If it doesn't, well, you just learn. So, I don't know. I had a little bit different mentality uh, towards it, towards the end, I feel like. After this period and before the major that everyone knows is going to be like the happy ending to this part, where you had this whole summer period where famously, I've not only done interviews with Kassad and Azar and people about this, but even behind the scenes, if, if you know Kassad, you can imagine he was complaining about this shit all the time, it's just who he is, right? He's a guy who complains, but he's always right, he's not, he's not that full of shit. Basically, like, this was one of the most messed up periods ever, because it was where, like, Gratis Faction couldn't play, and then he couldn't even come oh, to the yeah. events, then you had to have, like, smoothier for an event, then you had to, like, do stand-ins, and as a result, you're not only still traveling all around and flying everywhere and doing boot camps but you go to every fucking tournament it's like it feels like you come last place in every tournament and then basically before the major it's almost like fuck is it just dead again like even when you get grass faction back it's like you haven't got any prep time you have to just play tournaments again like this was this must have been an incredibly stressful period uh, th- th- this was a tough period 100 percent. and we were like constantly traveling and i also remember like i don't know if you remember but <laughs> there was even a time where i think we were we had a stand it was smooth and cutler playing for us because i go. was 
I, I was in Denmark. Like the the the, the time for, to get like I had to renew my views, visa, P1 visa, and like the, the the wait in Norway was like forever. And we were checking every city in Europe that I could go to. And then Denmark had one, but it was like four days wait. So I couldn't travel to America. So they played like two games with, or maybe one game. So I remember I flew, I flew in, like I got my visa. I flew to America to, for like Pro League day two, I think. Landed at like 12 o'clock, like midday. And the, the game was like five. I was standing at the airport, like legit in the custom for like four hours, straight to the game. And like Cutter just got booted out of the game I had to play. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Isn't it? Yeah, but, uh, just, Get out his ear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I don't know. It was, it was it was crazy times, and especially with this faction, like he was fucked for so long. Like we, we had oh, so many tournaments, and looking back there, we were playing with Smuya, and, and like Smuya's individual level is good. Uh, he's funny to be around, and I think I was the sad thing. I think I was the only one that got along with him. Right, because, but I I don't know. I feel like I usually get along with most people, but the, the rest of them had some issues with Smuya. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> like Casa and Smuya, uh, so some of the players in Smuya, like there, there wasn't the best connections. So it was definitely a little bit more rough than you know. Usually, like yeah, you just play with the stand-in and you try to do the best, you know, and you have a good team chemistry. But it was fucking bad chemistry as well. So it, it was hard times, hard times. Since as you're talking about, you also got to see because I've always thought, you know, in the modern day when all these Americans who were used to having the cushiest life ever. They lived in America. They had their own slots. All Half the tournaments were there. They all made loads of money. They all got to live with their parents. They all in at home with, with all their family. When they had to experience what the Australians did, which is like, now you've got to go live in Europe for three months. Like, what do you mean three months? Yeah, just the whole time. You're in a fucking yeah. hotel room. You play. Like, And then I always used to say, the Australians also had to do those like 30-hour flights. And like you're saying, 30-hour flight, and then like the next day you play. It's not like you have a week off to like chill out. And re- you're just like jet lagged as fucking just play. And then by the way, the fan on HLTV, he doesn't remember. Remember that he just looks nah. on the scoreboard and goes, "Your shit, you lost the game." Like these guys, they were not only living away from home permanently; they're doing these flights. That you were doing some of it. This this lifestyle, like I think you guys were the hardest workers in the scene in that sense, right? You had a really hard time. Yeah, I, I think we lived. Uh, JKS and ASR definitely lived it longer than me, but I lived for three years like that. And satisfaction and Leas for like two and a half, maybe or two. And like it was, it was mental sometimes. Like, and, and then most like. The, f- the most fucked up thing is like I see the um, Austra- uh, American players is like we travel to Katowice then to Kiev and then they go back and they're like finally home Can't two know. weeks without my own bed I'm like what the fuck two weeks <laughs> it's, been, it's been five and a half months dude like exactly. give me a break you know like and yeah like it, it was tough but there was no scene in America in in, uh, in Australia sorry so there was no option to go back and the scene in America was good at the time and we yes. were playing all the best tournaments so we were living the dream anyway even though the schedule was tough. The travel was tough. Like, I, don't, I wouldn't change it for anything. Honestly, like, time of my life and time of our team's life. I'm sure, like, if all of the people in that team, Renegades, 100 Thieves, if they could go back, we all would go back. Because that was fucking glory days, even though it was tough. And it was. I'm sure it was the same for the SK guys. They were kind of the, the only team at the time that was living the same life. There was a couple of other Brazilian teams also living overseas, but they were the same as us, like, going to all the best tournaments. And they were winning as well, so... I feel like us and them were, were definitely the teams that was maybe not the hardest workers, in my opinion, but like more like sacrificing the most for sure. As I alluded to earlier, I was told that story by Kassad that even when you were in America, you would like always keep in contact with your family and be talking to them all the time. Right? One thing I wanted to ask about was that, because like on the one hand, I've also heard, by the way, this might sound weird to people who've never experienced this. I've heard if you actually go when you're used to living in your home country, you go to a country and like speak, you're obviously totally fluent in English, but it actually gets so that like if you don't keep in contact, like you actually almost forget your Norwegian, you know, like you, you, you forget it, talking it, you forget everything about going on. Is it true? It's 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 really really weird. Like I remember, like first six months in America, five months, I travel back home and I'm sitting at the dinner table with my my parents, my brothers, and I'm like, I can't find the words. Sorry, I can't find the words. Like I need to take, I need to say it in English, and you need to tell me the Norwegian words. Of course, I know the Norwegian word, you know, but I'm just like, it's been so long since I've been speaking with someone. Like I always kept in touch, but it was always via chat, you know. And then it's easier, you know. But when you it, it's it sounds silly that you actually like forget your own language, but you do. And I know like I know Kassar probably said the same, you know, because he was always in English as well. I don't know. It, it's strange. 
The other thing I wanted to know was, like, look, no offence to you, I'm sure you won't take any, you were known to be a little bit more of a quiet guy. You weren't the guy who was, like, the crazy guy at all the after parties or whatever. You were, like, more, you had your own group of people, a lot of the people from the Fears and the G2 days and the Norwegian guys. What I would ask is this, when you were in America, was it also tough to have, like, social life? Like, Americans are very different. They have their own ideas. It's, it's not as easy to just make friends, right? Yeah, legit. The, the, the social life was really tough. I think that would be uh, the worst part about it, honestly. Like, when we lived in Detroit, not saying it was because it was Detroit and it's not, like, my favorite city in the world, but, like, we knew nobody. It was us, six, seven, and nobody else. We were always alone, always together, but never with anyone else. Like, we didn't have anything. And there was even a time... Like, I, I was saying it, like, fuck this, we have no social life, we need to do something. And I think we went to, like, a bar or a pub or whatever it was, just, like, a shit one, and I got so fucking drunk, and I think I even, <laughs> I, they, like, I puked all over the house, and it was, like, crazy, all I remember, but we just needed, we had nothing of it, you know? So when you first had the chance to, like, go out and do something, we always did it, like, but, like, not, not, at, not at parties, but not at tournaments, I mean, I don't know, like, I like to go out drinking, like, I don't mind it, but usually at tournaments... It like all the people I never speak with, all the players, all of a sudden try to become your best friend, and they uh, so weird, isn't it? <laughs> and I just like I I can't be bothered. So I always had my own group, and we all were always like it was just us, like good friends, you know. And it's the same when I was in Katowice the last time I was there was twenty twenty, and when we went out, I like the people I go out with is like my uh, my team, and then I invite Rain, his girlfriend. Some of the and he invites a couple of players and we just become a group, you know. Yes. And it, and it, that is just the way that we do it. And I don't know. It, like I, I don't need to be friends with everyone in the scene. I don't really give a shit, honestly. This video was kindly supported by Kill Your Inner Loser, Ahmed Haju, Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Paul Villa. Travis Goff, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Hades, Jensen Go, Kovacevic, Pacey, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Tukan, and as always, special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my shows? Would you like to ask a question in my Patreon AMA? Maybe you want teasers, find out who the next Reflections guests are or upcoming talk show guests. Do you want to take part in one of those long donated discussions with me? Well, if any of the above or more sound interesting to you, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Risk of Illuminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.